Tonight we are going to be hearing from Kevin Smith. Uh, he'll be talking to us um, with this uh, topic being open source chat ops with COG. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate Bloomberg for providing us with this space and thank you to everyone who's here for coming on out. Uh, we do this for you and so your participation is vital to having this event work. Tonight, before we get started, we have our usual requests. Silence your cell phones. Uh, please do not eat snacks and noisy wrappers. And please use the mics for questions uh, so you can be heard and uh, people will understand the questions and the answers when it comes to the video later on. That's a big, uh, a big important thing for us. We are still finalizing our next meeting topic and the date, so please watch our meetup page for more info. We should have that shortly. Um, I'd like to repeat our thanks to our regular space sponsor, Bloomberg, and acknowledge our other sponsors, past and present. That's IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Also, um, Pearson Publishing. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who contribute greatly and constantly over the years. Uh, uh, say thank you to anyone who's been helping out at the desk or who you know has been uh, working with us. It really uh, makes things work. Sorry, that's a little awkward. So announcements. Uh, first, let me just say workshops. Please uh, talk to uh, David over here or Rob about the Nylog workshops. The next one should be uh, at City College at 138th and Amsterdam on Tuesday, August 23rd from 6 to 8. That is also up on the Nylog Meetup page, so you can find it there. In case you missed it, you can grab Linux Distro DVD in the back on the, one of the windowsills over there. In addition, Kevin has brought some uh, operable uh, COG stickers for you. Uh, he may have some t-shirts for later on also, uh, if you ask him nicely. We do have books today for the trivia, so Kevin will be uh, answering, uh, will be asking four questions. Those who answer will be able to take their choice for those books, so take notes. And let's see, after the presentation, we will be heading to Jake's Saloon at 206 West 23rd Street, our new regular location. That's across 7th Avenue from here. So does anyone in the audience have announcements for upcoming events or things that they'd like to talk about? I know we have at least one. Come on up. Thanks, PD. Well, 209 is a pretty a big number to, to match over there. But uh, there will be the second, a little short of 209, Container Days, New York in November, beginning of November, all things around unikernels and containers and Docker and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, with all the funky things. It's like a two-day meetup. It's supposed to be a lot of fun, similar, run by volunteers who will answer crazy numbers of emails. Uh, search for Container Days NYC if you want to find it. Um, don't just search Container Days because you'll get the day to get, take the trash out, look for Eventbrite. Uh, There's the same joke as last year, but unfortunately we haven't improved our SEO to the point that that's no longer a problem. So go check it out. Does anyone else have any events to announce? Okay, I will mention that uh, NYC DevOps Days is going to be happening um, the weekend following Velocity. I believe it's the 23rd or the 24th. I have to double check, but that is happening. It's a Friday and a Saturday this year, so it's not to bump too much into Velocity's uh, events. Uh, September. Did I say October? Did I say November? Right, that is not August, sorry, thank you. Yes, that'll be in September. So, um, just wanted to mention that in case anyone is interested in getting tickets or sponsoring, there's still sponsorships available if that's what your company's into. Um, I, I gotta stop saying um. <laughs> All right, uh, as I mentioned at the end of the presentation, there will be trivia questions. Uh, Kevin will ask them, and it'll be based on the material from the presentation. We have four books, as I mentioned earlier, so prepare for that. Kevin uh, will have questions that are devilishly hard and well prepared. Absolutely <laughs> not. I would like, I'm going to repeat a bit of the bio from the page. Kevin Smith is the CTO and co founder of Operable, the company behind COG. He has over 20 years of engineering experience in a variety of fields, including PaaS systems at Engine Yard and Heroku, distributed databases at Basher Technologies, and recently technical leadership roles at Chef and Planet Labs. So, um, at question time, which he will tell you when the question times are, and come up to the mics and ask your questions. Please beat him up with uh, that in mind. Now, please welcome Kevin Smith with Open Source Chat Ops with COG. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, thank you. Wow. Um, so, um, my name is Kevin Smith. Um, I'm CTO of Operable, and before I get into my presentation, I want to give you guys a little bit of background about the company and how we came to, to build COG. So in a previous life, um, I was VP of engineering at Chef. And uh, before that, worked at Red Hat on the Red Hat network uh, product. So for a long time, I've done ops, I've done systems management, but from kind of the engineering side, building software to help people 
in ops do their jobs. My co-founder, who's also a good friend of mine, is a guy named Mark Embriarco, who some of you might have heard of. Um, one of the original employees at 37 Signals was uh, one of the senior ops guys at GitHub and helped build Hubot and, and kind of pioneer the whole use of chat ops. We've been knocking around these ideas for a long time about you know, uh, things that people are missing with chat ops, um, reasons why it doesn't get quite the uptake that we think it probably should. And so we finally had an opportunity to kind of come together and, and put all of our ideas uh, into software and kind of show it off to everyone. So that's kind of what I'm going to do this evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about what chat ops is. Uh, hopefully folks are at least a little familiar with it. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about COG, but then we're going to actually use COG uh, if the internet gods smile upon me. Um, so about a third of my talk is actually demos, and uh, we can talk about how things work with COG as, as we kind of go along. So, so what is chat ops? Um, so I got this quote uh, from, if you can see down here on the bottom, uh, a fairly decent article written by, I believe, the CTO at PagerDuty uh, for VentureBeat, and he calls chat ops conversation-driven development. And I tend to kind of agree with that. You know, one of the real powers of chat ops isn't that you're, like, working in chat. It's that you're working in chat with, like, the rest of your team and, you know, the rest of the people in your company. So it's very transparent, very easy to collaborate. Um, if you want to see what someone's done in the past, you just scroll back in your chat history. It's super convenient. Um, I also tend to think of it as uh, collaborative, transparent problem solving. So quick show of hands, how many people here have ever dealt with like an outage? I figured this room would have a lot of folks like that. So, you know, it used to be you'd have an outage, you're off SSH'd into boxes, looking at stats, you know, off looking in Munin or whatever, looking at your graphs. Um, and it's a little hard to collaborate. You know, you're trying to cut and paste and drop box files or whatever so people can see what you're seeing. With chat ops, you can do all of that kind of in one place. It's a little bit like having Tmux on steroids it is kind of a nice mental shortcut for it. And it's continuous pairing. Um, one thing that I didn't realize about chat ops until Mark and I started talking about it is it's a great way to bootstrap new hires um, and kind of get them up to speed. Um, and that really uh, goes back to the collaborative and transparent uh, aspects of chat ops. So you've got a new guy, and he might know ops, but he doesn't know much about how your team works or about how your infrastructure is designed or what your processes are. Well, he can see people doing their jobs like right there in chat. And if he runs into a problem like during his first on-call rotation or whatever, you know, he's right there in chat with the rest of the team. So. Chat ops is moving tasks which used to be performed in isolation online, where uh, sharing and collaboration can happen. Um, I, I uh, have a background mostly working on remote teams. So I've lived in Raleigh, North Carolina for about 13 years. And the companies I've worked for have been uh, located mostly in either the Bay Area or up here in the Northeast Corridor, like Boston. Um, San Francisco, San Jose, places like that. Um, so I've got about a, mm, 10 years of working remotely. And uh, what I've noticed is more and more teams, it used to be it was fairly unique to find other people that worked remotely. Like when I started doing this, most everybody like still went to offices and worked you know, geographically co-located. But as time has gone on, um, I think the remote team has become, or the distributed team has become a lot more common. And I think one of the drivers for that is hiring. It's a lot easier to hire good people if you can close your hiring pitch with, and you can stay right the hell where you are. You don't have to move to San Francisco or New York or LA or Chicago or anywhere else. Um, and so I think what we're going to see, I think we're already starting to see it, and I think it's just going to continue. The trend's going to accelerate where more and more teams are distributed and more work, um, more collaboration is going to move into mediums like chat. Um, this is a big driver for us with COG. Uh, we want to extend the uh, CLI kind of terminal experience into chat. Um, and this is where we're pretty different from a lot of other bots that are out there. We take a lot of our inspiration from Unix, 
And so we strive to look a lot more like a traditional Unix environment, but in chat. Um, this allows us to do some things you can't do with other bots, or at least not easily. And mostly that has to do with the uh, kind of shell-like syntax that we support. And finally, ChatOps helps teams move faster, learn more quickly, and collaborate better than before. I don't think many people would dispute that. So I, um, I like to think about you know, uh, the current available bots in, in two ways. There's the current generation, and then there's um, the generation that's coming, of which I think we're part of, or at least I like to think we're part of. But then again, I'm biased. Um, so of the current generation, we really have three big projects. Hubot, which I think most people have heard of, uh, another one called Lita, and Airbot. Um, Hubot is probably the most well-known since it comes out of GitHub and is uh, arguably like the original chat ops bot. Uh, but uh, the other two also have a fair number of, of users. So the pros. So it's a traditional architecture, and we'll get to what that means here in a minute. Um, this means a couple of things. It uh, means it's simple, and it's fairly easy to understand and fairly easy to deploy, but it's not without some drawbacks. Um, all of these bots are pretty easy to configure and install, uh, depending, at least in Hubot's case, on how high a tolerance you have for NPM and CoffeeScript. My tolerance is fairly low. Uh, they have well-established communities. Hubot's been around for a few years, and it kind of has the, the benefit of being the first. Um, the other bots also have decent-sized communities. All of these projects have been around at least for a couple of years. Um, and we're, us and other bots are kind of the new kids on the block. And they are extensible if you know the right language. Um, so if I go back to this slide here, um, all of these bots are tightly coupled to the languages they're written in. So if you want to extend Hubot, Lita, or Airbot, you're generally going to find yourself working in the languages that they were implemented in. Um, and that has some interesting kind of technical side effects, among which are your scripts or your, um, your new features or extensions run in the same memory and address space as the rest of the bot which may or may not be a big deal depending on the size and sophistication of your team and environment. Um, all of these bots kind of come out of startup land where the need for kind of compliance and audit is fairly lax. And so they play fairly fast and loose with some of this, and that's, that's fine. Um, it's just not the only way to do it. And with all of these bots, um, where your code runs right in the same memory and address space, really anything is possible with enough coding to a certain extent. Um, I've seen a couple of projects that have tried to graft like uh, permissions and ACLs onto Lita and Hubot with varying degrees of success. Um, that's a, a concept which kind of gets its tentacles into everything for folks that have ever had to implement or work with like sophisticated permissions or ACL systems. And that's kind of a hard thing to add into software kind of after the fact. So this is a traditional bot architecture. It's, like I said, fairly simple. Um, you have, do I have a mouse pointer? Yes, I do. Cool. So you have your chat network, you know, Slack, HipChat, IRC, whatever it is that you use. You have users connected to it, and then the bot talks directly to your chat network. But then an interesting uh, note is that your bot also has to touch whatever it's managing. So if you install, say, like EC2 scripts to uh, create, delete, manage your instances or whatever, um, your bot has to talk directly to EC2. Um, if it's touching things inside your infrastructure, it has to have access to that. And that can have ramifications um, as far as things like, say, PCI compliance where you, know, you, want, you might need to have some strong firewall segregation between different environments. So cons, some of these uh, I think I've already touched on. Um, yep, that one for sure. Um, all of these 
have minimal to no access controls, um, which is interesting. So what this really means is anyone who has a chat login can tell the bot to do anything, which is either really awesome or incredibly terrifying, depending on your point of view. Um, Mark, my co-founder, has a story he tells when he gave a talk, I think it was in Velocity uh, West a couple years ago where he was talking about his experience with chat ops, and he got a page that uh, GitHub was being uh, DDoS'd, so from his gate at the airport, he logs into chat and like kicks in their DDoS uh, mitigation and, and m massages some routes all from there, and there was like no permissions around that or anything like anybody could have done that. So he's giving this talk about chat ops, and he tells a story, and he says like there was several people from like Goldman in the front row, and they all just like blanched, went like totally white, like anybody can do that? Like yeah, anyone that has a chat login. What's the problem? Uh, minimal or no audit capability. Uh, and again, this is something that you can add, and you see some of these features get reinvented on each deployment, but these aren't things like primary features that the bots support kind of out of the box. And um, so when I was at Chef, we, had, we installed and used Hubot for a while. And one of the things I noticed, and this is um, kind of, I have more anecdotal evidence to support this, um, talking to friends of mine, uh, the care and feeding of these bots um, gets to be kind of problematic over time. And this goes back to the extension points are basically just scripts you're dropping into a directory that it just loads and runs. So over time, you get like dependencies between scripts, and then you change this one script, and that breaks these three other scripts, and you know, the guy that wrote the script is now no longer with the company, but you need it for your CI pipeline, and you know, it's crazy. And they're generally tied to a single programming language, um, which for small teams is maybe not a bad thing. I mean, generally, you probably pick the bot that uses the language that your team is most comfortable with. Um, but in larger teams, if you're trying to roll out something like this to multiple teams, you know, that can become a problem. And uh, a pet peeve of mine, in fact, I have a little mini rant about this, um, verbose syntax with limited expressiveness. I don't know anyone that likes typing for typing's sake. And pardon my French, this shit drives me nuts sometimes. I have some examples of this in a minute. So before I get to my mini rant, any questions so far? Twice? OK. So my mini rant, syntax matters, and syntax matters a lot. Uh, this is an excerpt from a, uh, a, a team working with Hubot. Uh, they have an open source project on GitHub. I pulled this right from their readme. Uh, they will remain nameless because I'm nice. Um, so if we can set aside for a minute, they're using BPM, which is just a horrible technology to begin with, and they should feel bad. Um, Look at this syntax. Does anyone like the thought of having to type in this kind of thing? I mean, it, to me, it seems incredibly verbose. It's like football. Yeah. So this makes me really sad. And I think if only this was a solved problem. And then I remember, oh, wait, we have Unix. Piping command since 1973. So. We look, come on. So if we look at this, the reason these things are so verbose is because you have no ability to compose commands together like you can in a Unix command line, like in a terminal. And what that does is it causes them to have to add all of these like connector phrases. So everything that's in bold is information you actually care about. The rest of this is just kind of connector stuff to make it easier for the bot to parse and to make up for the fact that you can't compose these commands together. So this has a total of 148 characters. There's 21 words, so counting you know, white space separated, separated bits. Um, there's 12 connector words. So 
But overhead here measured in terms of typing things that don't actually contribute to doing anything is like 57%. Now granted this isn't totally scientific, but um, really grinds my gears. And I see this with bots, new bots coming out even, everyone is on this kind of natural language kick. And honestly, why? Um, yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. What's that? Yeah, okay. Um, but not for chat ops, maybe. Yeah, all right. Yeah, the thing is, if this is what your syntax looks like, and you get paged at 2 a.m. and you're trying to, to debug or troubleshoot an outage, and you have to start reeling off these one-liners to figure out what's going on, like this is a nightmare to type. So instead, it could look something like this, which looks a lot more Unix-y, and I would hazard a guess, probably a bit more friendly to folks, at least in this room. So one thing to notice here is there's a pipe. So there's this location command, and you can take the output of their BPM invoke. And once you've got that all set up, then you tell it where to run it, and then the magic happens. I haven't actually written any of the code to do this. I just refactored their syntax to something that, to me, looked a lot more sane, and I wouldn't actually mind typing. So when you do this, it's a lot less typing. Uh, there's fewer words, there's no connector words, and there's really no overhead. Um, now to your readability point, um, designing commands like this is an art. Uh, it's not really a science. Um, and we have thought long and hard about how to do this. Um, in the COG doc site, I, I sent the link to when uh, I, I was getting set up for this talk, we have a whole page that talks about kind of our uh, design ideology behind these commands and how you ought to think about building them and how to design for both readability and usability, which I won't get into here, um, but it's a thing we really think quite a lot about. Uh, there's some interesting work that's been done in kind of the distant past on this kind of stuff that, that turns out to be fairly relevant. Some of the early work that was done on Unix, as well as in the late 70s, there was some work done around interactive compilers and interactive programming environments, especially um, coming out of like the small talk community. That seems, at least to me, to be fairly relevant and applicable to kind of these chat ops environments. So that's my mini rant. So next, I'm gonna get into COG, but before I do that, um, any questions or comments about syntax? Yes. Problem with any kind of chat ops, uh, tab completion. Yes. I wish we had it. Um, it's really hard to do with chat ops unless you own the network and the client. Um, so we're, we right now primarily focus on Slack integration. And so you wind up working inside Slack's client and you get the, the UX affordances that they provide and they don't provide any kind of tab completion. Uh, we've thought about writing our own Slack client, but that violates their TOS. Um, so we can't do that. Um, but yeah, uh, my long-term vision for chat ops is to have kind of a, to get away from the chat aspect of it so much and to have more of just kind of a shared online shell environment where you can't have things like tab completion and also have like a chat aspect to it as well. But that's a ways in the future. Yeah, yeah, a lot like that or like IPython to some extent. Yeah, yeah, that's where I take a lot of my inspiration from. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, introducing COG. Um, COG is implemented in a mixture of Elixir and Go. Um, for folks that haven't maybe heard of Elixir, it's a Ruby-like functional programming language that runs on top of the Erlang VM. Um, 
Prior to starting Operable, I was an Erlang programmer for like eight years. Um, so Erlang, for all of its warts, I don't know how many people have ever in this room have ever seen Erlang. Its syntax looks a lot like Prolog. And there are like all the like thumbs up. Syntax is horrible. Um, but it's a great language for building really concurrent, uh, scalable, and robust systems. And that's why we picked Elixir for the main core of COG. There's an outboard component, which we'll talk about, called a Relay that COG uses to actually execute uh, the chat ops commands. And that's implemented in Go, uh, simply because Go programs are stupid, easy to deploy. Otherwise, it'd be written in Elixir, but because Go. Eh. So this is what COG's architecture looks like. It's a little different. Uh, from the traditional architecture we saw a few slides ago. So you still have the chat network, which in our case is primarily Slack. Uh, we're in the process of reworking our interface to the chat providers. And so before we supported both Slack and HipChat, and we're uh, temporarily pulling our HipChat support until we have a chance to rework that. Um, HipChat, since they were acquired by Alassian, introduced V2 of their API which is a little weird to work with, and so that, that might take a, a bit of time to, to figure out. In any case, uh, COG sits uh, on your chat network, looks just like a regular user, and he uses Postgres to store all of his state. Um, we don't really care where Postgres runs. This could be like RDS or Heroku's Postgres service, just as long as it's Postgres, or at least looks like Postgres. We're cool. Um, that is really all COG needs to talk to itself. Uh, everything else as far as running commands and uh, touching parts of your infrastructure are handled by these other components, uh, these relays. Uh, COG has a built-in message bus. It embeds a MQTT message bus and uses that to talk to relays. Uh, so the only uh, connectivity it needs is a single port, uh, 18, 1883 uh, for plain text, I think, 1886 for SSL, I might be wrong there, uh, to talk to the relays, and that's it. Uh, so you can uh, really segregate uh, who can see what fairly nicely. Uh, the relays run Go and run this Go program, and they're responsible for uh, executing the commands and allowing the commands to you know, talk to whatever it is they need to talk to to get their job done. Any questions about Arch before we move on? Yeah, yeah. So COG has its own notion of users and permissions and uh, uh, permission rules, access control lists, and all that's stored in the database. Um, and relays pull down the information they need uh, over the message bus talking to COG. Um, but really, all of, the, all of the persistent state is in Postgres. Everything else is ephemeral and can, and can be rebuilt if you restart the relay. Um, yeah, I have a question about, about both the relays and your choice of writing your own or having your own relays. Is there a reason to not also, or is there an ability to punt the relay to something like uh, uh, SQS or something else so that if you already have uh, an existing queue in place, you can just feed it rather than having to poke holes? Yeah, so uh, right now COG requires MQTT, and that's only because we haven't had any reason to do anything else. But the way it's architected is it's, it, the messaging bits are all modular, and it would be fairly easy, maybe a day or two worth of work, to drop in another queue and, and teach it how to talk to the relays over a, a different queue. Um, the queue doesn't even have to be running as part of COG. Right now, COG starts up a queue. You can tell it not to, just as kind of a convenience to help you know, get things off the ground and get things bootstrapped easily. Uh, but all it really needs to know is like, where is the queue and how do I connect to it? Good question, though. Any other questions? Yes. Talks to the Postgres directly to get the, the state? No, uh, relays only talk to, like in this diagram, 
let's say you're running a, a command uh, that monitors your servers in your test environment. Uh, Relay would only need to talk uh, to the test environment as part of running that command, and it would talk to COG over this message bus, and that's it. It never talks to Postgres directly. COG has a, a REST API that we expose over the message bus as well as over HTTP, and that's what the relays use to pull down information they need. And, and we'll see this in action in a little bit. Any other questions? So um, one of our big theories that we're seeking to prove is uh, one of the things standing in the way of uh, kind of a broader adoption of chat ops is uh, the lack of any kind of sophisticated uh, user management or access controls. And so that's something we designed into COG from the very beginning and it's baked right into the core of the bot. So you have a standard user management model uh, you have permissions that are assigned to roles. Roles are granted to groups. And groups contain users. I mean, this is all fairly traditional stuff, but none of the other bots really do this. Um, these permissions and the rules, which we'll see in a minute, uh, allow you to express some fairly fine-grained uh, access uh, controls. Um, for example, you can tell um, like this, uh, people with this permission can delete from this S3 bucket. All these other people can only list what's in the S3 bucket. Um, for larger teams, we just recently added uh, automatic user creation. Uh, so one of, uh, where COG has its own idea of a user, that's separate from like the user account you have with your chat provider. And so if you wanna talk to COG, you have to have a COG user configured. Um, some of our users are rolling this out to fairly large uh, teams or sets of teams that's like 60 or 100 people, and they're like, I really don't wanna have to create 60 or 100 accounts. So we added this feature where the very first time you talk to COG, it'll say, oh, hey, I don't know who you are. Let me create an account for you. It's not gonna grant you any permissions or anything, but it will at least know who you are, and then the admin can go in and like set you up with the right groups and permissions and that kind of thing. So it saves the admin a little bit of, of legwork. So access controls. Um, Access conditions are described in a custom rule language that we designed just, just to solve this problem. Um, these rules can reference uh, chat commands, uh, the options that these chat commands support, and arguments that you pass these chat commands. So here's an example of one. So what this rule is expressing, and we'll go uh, through it line by line, uh, only ops can delete entries from the corp prod S3 bucket. So you say when the command is AWS S3 and the option bucket matches this regular expression and the first argument is delete, then the user executing this command must have the site ops permission. And if you don't have that, COG will tell you to buzz off. You can combine rules together to express kind of this uh, more fine-grained, kind of nuanced view. Uh, in COG, uh, the most specific matching rule determines uh, what you can do, and the default, it starts with a you can't do anything until it finds a rule that says yes, you can. Uh, so you can say when someone runs this S3 command and the bucket matches your this regular expression, you can allow it, unless they say delete, in which case they have to have uh, site ops. So in the case where they type delete um, in COG's view of things, where's my mouse? Uh, in COG's view of things, this rule is more specific than this rule, and so it wins. So this allows you to have kind of a more general rule and then override like for specific situations that you care about so you can kind of manage your access by exceptions.
and it has support for like in um, contains type uh, expressions as well. So what this is saying is if uh, if you have any of the permissions ops engineering or QA and this uh, first clause matches what you're matches the command you're trying to run, then you're allowed to do it. If you don't match the second half, then you're out of luck. Yes. When you said the rules are matched and the more specific, specific rule wins, mm -hmm. is it always that the specific rule wins or is it that the one that allows, sorry, disallows wins? So if you have uh, a tie where two rules are equally specific, so they both rack up the same number of matches, and one says allow and one says deny, the deny wins. Okay. So we, we try to be very conservative and always bias on the side of saying no. Oh. We figure that's a lot less surprising, has a lot fewer side effects than if we were to say yes, and then someone deletes or yeah. reboots something that, that you didn't There's want like them to. There's like a less specific rule, but it says no, would the more specific rule win in that case? Yes. Yeah, the more specific rule always wins. Okay. So even if it means allow, well, there is like a specific rule that says deny. Oh, sorry. There's a general rule that says deny, but there's a more specific rule that says allow, the allow will still win. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. So I'm almost in the slides, and then we'll get into seeing COG in action here. So just a brief thing about our uh, command syntax. It has a really strong resemblance to the Unix shell, and that's totally on purpose. Um, it's not this kind of pidgin English natural language thing really don't like for this kind of problem domain. Um, we allow you to compose multiple commands and pipes, um, where in Unix, you know, everything that flows from one command to another is plain text. We've taken a slightly different approach. Commands emit JSON, so it's more structured, and JSON flows between stages of your pipeline. And we also have output redirection. Uh, you know, the, the good old angle bracket operator like you use in a shell. Uh, so you can run a, a command in one room and pipe the output as a direct message to somebody else or pipe it as a direct message to somebody else in another chat room or two chat rooms or, or whatever. It's fairly flexible. So before I get into showing COG, um, any questions about any of the stuff I've covered so far? A couple of, um, sorry, mentioned a couple of different uh, popular uh, chat applications, but there are a lot of them. You know, you haven't mentioned Link, Skype, IRC, Matterhorn, XMPP, anything like that. Yeah, so HipChat is XMPP under the covers, and our integration with it uh, was using their XMPP API, but they're end of lifing that, which sucks. Uh, because it's a lot harder with their new API to, to do what a bot needs to do. You don't appear uh, as just a, another user in the room, so you don't have access to, to like the full stream of chat commands and chat events and everything that you'd normally have. Um, the uh, COGS uh, chat interface is all modular. It's, it has this idea of providers, and so we have the Slack provider because our team uses Slack. And so that's the one we, we mostly care about. But where we're open source, um, if anyone would love to contribute a provider, that would be great. There's like six functions you have to implement. It's, it's not bad at all. You have to be able to look up a room and look up a user and send a message and receive a message. And um, I think and send a direct message. And that's it. Um, we would really like to extend uh, COGS capability into other um, chat networks as well. The real problem we have right now is that our whole team is only six people, and so there's only so much time in a day and how much six guys can get done. Um, another question. Um, so obviously these commands are very flexible and you can program anything you want, but you, um, you haven't talked about any kind of linkages or to uh, configuration management systems. Um, usually we're not pumping directly into production, run this command, but more like, 
change config management, commit it to Git, <laughs> pull it back out, run a review, then run it in production. Um, do you have any workflows, pipelines, or anything about that? Yeah, so internally, uh, we deploy from CI. Um, and uh, until recently, we had like a, a manual go button we would hit when we were ready to deploy, like, oh, the build's green, let's roll that out to prod. Um, and we wired that go button up to chat command. And my experience has been, I think that's where a lot of teams would start with like that kind of deploy pipeline. Um, certainly possible, um, and we played around with it, and again, it comes back to like six people. There's you know a, a lot we'd like to do, but only so much we can get to right now. Um, being able to provide like this end-to-end -end workflow that that does things like you know pull request review and merging and you know all the way up through like you know monitoring your CI builds and then poking your config management system to deploy, you know to roll out the deploy. That's a whole like solution we really want to build. We just haven't quite got there yet. Mentioned CI. What um, build frameworks or build tools have you integrated with? So right now we use um, two. We use Circle CI, and we also use another uh, um, CI provider, BuildKite. That's our main uh, build. Um, uh, that's our main build environment for COG. Uh, we have some uh, third-party bundles coming from the community that have um, integrated, I believe, like someone has written a Jenkins bundle. And I don't know if he's released it yet, but I know that there's someone working on a Travis bundle. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? OK. Let's see if the demo gods smile upon me. Okay, so let me start up COG here. So this is gonna start up COG from scratch. Um, right before I walked over here from my apartment, I blew away the database. So we're starting like completely from a, from a fresh start. There's COG running. Now I'll start, this is a relay running in a separate terminal tab. So Relay starts fairly quick and goes kind of nice that way. And one of the things you'll notice here is that it's trying to connect and uh, can't. And that's because, yeah, uh, that's because COG doesn't know about that relay. So only relays that you've configured that COG knows about can connect to COG. Uh, if a, like a rogue relay tries to connect and it doesn't know about it, it'll tell you to buzz off. So the first thing I need to do is set up that relay. Well, the very first thing I need to do. So COG comes with this command line tool called COG Coddle. So when you first install COG, uh, it comes up with like virtually no state, and so you need to bootstrap it. Uh, what bootstrapping does is it installs a bunch of built-in commands and kind of configures a few things um, so you can get up and running. So now that that's done, yep, so there aren't any relays. That in my, huh, I do, I love ZSH. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create this relay and tell COG to enable it. So I could create this relay and not enable it, in which case COG would still not allow it to do anything. But I'll go ahead and tell it to enable. So it's enabled, and so I'm doing this all like in a couple uh, uh, terminal tabs to make it easier to talk about in demo. 
Um, we also have Docker Compose files. And this is all, uh, COG and Relay both are all configured. You can do it through config files, but all of the knobs you really care about are also configurable via environment variables to make it really easy to set up and deploy. So since I don't want to wait 33 seconds. There we go. So it has connected. So we can see it started, it's connected, it started up three message bus connections to COG. So now COG knows about it. So next thing I will do, let's deploy a command. So a brief blurb here. So we have a, a separate uh, GitHub uh, org for hosting all of our commands. Um, so we have the operable org, which is where the COG source code lives. But then we also have a number of uh, command bundles um, that live in this COG command. This is kind of the beginning stages of eventually where you want to have like some sort of command bundle bazaar or marketplace or something where it's a lot easier to discover um, uh, these bundles and install them. Uh, this is another area where we're a little different from the other bots. Um, so the other bots I mentioned, Hubot, Lita, Airbot, um, you extend all of them by just like writing scripts and dropping them into a directory. Uh, COG has this notion of a command bundle which is a lot like, like an RPM or a deb file, um, but not nearly as complicated or, or a pain in the ass to work with. Um, and so when you deploy commands, you deploy a set of commands, which we call a bundle, and you deploy that, you install it into COG. So I'll do that. So. One more directory. Yep, there we go. So um, every uh, command bundle is described using this YAML file. And it describes things like, what's the name of the bundle? So this is a really basic EC2 and S3 bundle I wrote uh, when, when we were first uh, fleshing out uh, COGS command API. And you know it defines uh, a number of permissions. So commands can bring in, uh, define their own permissions. They can also bring in their own rules, uh, which can be overridden or deleted. Um, so each command also lists an ex uh, executable, some documentation, you know, options information. Another thing that's fairly interesting here is you'll see this uh, Docker block. Uh, there are, uh, we support two ways of packaging and deploying commands. So this YAML file represents metadata COG needs to know about your command and to let users execute it. Uh, to actually get at the code, you can do one of two things. You can either install like this user local bin EC2 find. You can e either install that kind of out of band, however it is that you install software, your config management tool or whatever, or you can package it up as a Docker image and uh, tell COG the name of it and uh, the tag. And when that uh, bundle gets assigned to a relay, relay is integrated with Docker and we'll go pull that image down, which we'll see happen here in just a minute. Okay. So now, so COG also has this notion of relay groups. Um, so when you create relays, you can assign them to groups. And then when you install bundles, you assign them to relay groups. So this gives you some control over, like, you might have this command installed, but you only want it to run in this relay that has access to your prod environment. So you create a, a relay group called prod relays, and then you assign that bundle only to your prod relays. 
Let's see. Come on. Yep. So, um, kind of a side note, uh, CogCoddle is using uh, Cog's REST API to do all this stuff. So this is all things that you, know, you could script as well. Uh, so if I flip over here to Relay, I don't want to wait for it to refresh. There we go. Okay, so you can see it logged. Uh, let's see. Updating uh, bundle catalog adds one, deletes zero. So it added the missed bundle. It knows about it and knows it can run it. And furthermore, if I go look at my images, I'll see that I have now the missed uh, image uh, pulled down in Docker. So when COG goes to execute this miss command, which I'll do now, it will fail pretty soon. Should fail. You can do help. And this will show you all the commands that are installed. Make it any bigger? Oh, it does. So everything that begins with operable is kind of a built-in command. Uh, but so now if I do, let's see, what was that? Uh, let's do EC2 find. So I don't have to type in the prefix unless there's other commands that conflict. So this is an error. It tells me I can't run this. Sorry, you need the uh, missed view permission. So in here. I'll add myself to the COG admin group. For what? Uh, yes, but the version I have installed has a bug, which I discovered in my hotel room, which is why I bounced out. Good eye. Uh, let's see. So. So I've just, I've added myself to the cog admin role and I granted the permission I was missing. Now if I try to run it, yep, I can't connect to EC2. And if I come over here, see, yep. So uh, commands can, can emit log messages that get entered into Relay's log. Uh, so as you're developing commands, you have some ability to see what's going on. We have libraries for Python and Ruby that wrap our, our command environment to make it easier to write commands. Um, but this tells me, error connecting to EC2, no handler was ready to authenticate. And so that tells me I don't have any creds configured, which I can fix. Um, Pog also has this notion of dynamic config. So another problem with the current set of bots is that uh, configuration for things like creds, you really have a couple of choices. You can roll your own integration with a tool like Vault, uh, or you just embed your creds, like in scripts, or put them in a file that your scripts can read. Um, we went a slightly different way. Gave this notion of uh, manage dynamic config. So I will 
And uh, these configs can be specific to a user, uh, specific to a room, or global. And they're in, in YAML as well. So I'm going to upload uh, this file, which contains my AWS creds. So now, flip back over. Yeah. So relay polls on a configurable interval. I set mine really low for the talk tonight. Um, so it picked up this new dynamic config. So now I know that when I run this command, So it is able to connect to EC2 and, and do its thing. Um, the commands are a little slow uh, on Wi-Fi because I have the bot running right here and Slack's you know, off wherever it is. So there's a couple of round trips that happen. Um, performance is much faster. Like we have a hosted COG offering that we're in the process of rolling out and uh, the performance is much snappier because it just so happens Slack also runs in AWS, which is where we are, so it's all good. Um, so yeah, this is an example of the, the JSON output that you get. Um, I can tell it, let's see, I can pipe it into, we'll just do echo just to show the, the pipelining here. So we have another command that lets me Oh, oh, so we can see this happening. So it detected that it had this new bundle assigned to it and it pulled the uh, associated uh, image from the upstream Docker registry. By default, it uses uh, Docker Hub, but that's all configurable. So if you're writing like your own private registry, you can tell it to, to use that. Um, finally, in an attempt to save us a bunch of typing, we added uh, shell style aliases. So you build up these pipelines, um, that's still a lot of typing. And so if you're like doing the same thing all the time, you can then write an alias. And aliases uh, can either be specific to a user or you can make them global. So it's a, either your own personal alias or an alias everybody can use. Um, so stuff I haven't talked about, uh, mostly in the interest of time and, and not boring you guys totally to tears. Um, where uh, my co-founder and I both spent a fair amount of time at Heroku, we used uh, their notion of build packs as our inspiration for uh, the command runtime environment. So going back to this thing about bundles, uh, when you run uh, or when you build a command, it doesn't, we don't care what the language is. What we want is an executable that we can run and we populate, and it's all in our documentation, we populate a whole set of environment variables that tells you who's executing the command, what room is the command in, what are the arguments that are being passed to you, what are all the options that are being passed to you, and then we say go do your thing. And then your command is responsible for emitting back some JSON on standard out that we take and, and then either display it to the user or route it on to the next stage of the pipeline. Yep. You've got a queue. You've got a queue. You've got um, basically a distributed command system. What about job control, the ability to stop, start, status commands, things like that that are underway, and also the ability to update things without interrupting things that are underway? We're building that. It's not there yet. Um, it's fairly fiddly to get right, um, but that's something we're actively working on.
I noticed the, the, the show like syntax. Uh, how much of uh, SH did you actually implement? Uh, not a lot. Uh, mostly just the notion of uh, the pipe operator, the pipelining and output redirection. And very basic stuff. And in, in the future, would you more closely follow uh, BinSH, uh, Bornshell, POSIX, or Bash? Uh, likely POSIX. All right. Or we could go totally rogue and say like CSH and B BSD for life, but probably the wrong crowd to say something like that. What are the uh, more interesting uh, uses you've seen people use with both the uh, composition? Because I think displaying is nice, but it's more interesting about having more complicated flows or things that can go. Can you also have that go between environments to say, run something on staging, and if the output is totally positive, then push it for review or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can totally do that. Um, right now, it's limited in that uh, we don't uh, expose a knob that allows the user to say, when this command runs, I only want it to run on this relay. That happens by making sure that command is only installed on that relay. Um, so you have these relay groups and you assign bundles to the relay group and that's what determines where the command runs. So is the idea that you would have different aliases for the same type of command? Like if, if I wanted to be able to have a deploy command that could go staging development and uh, production in different runs, would I then have three different commands and then alias them to be usable uh, in so that way? So right now, yeah, you would. Um, in a release coming soon, it's on our roadmap, uh, we want to expose routing rules so that you can say, kind of similar to our uh, permission uh, syntax, you'll say when the command looks like this, ship it off to this relay group. So you won't have to do that. That'll all be handled behind the scenes. You can say when the command is like, um, I don't know, like whatever your deploy command is and the environment is, is prod, then that goes to your prod uh, relay group. And what about, um, what, are there any limitations on the commands that can get run at the remote end, at the other end of the other side of the relay? Uh, like, I don't know, just ask him. Uh, only the the only limitation is the relay has to know about the command, so the bundle has to be assigned and enabled. If it's if it's not both of those things, then the relay won't know about it and won't run it. And from from the chat interface, can I look at the full logs? And you were switching back and forth a lot to look at the output. Is that something that I have to store elsewhere, or can I actually return that? and see the output of the entire command, success and failure, and the different stages along the way. Yeah, so right now, you either have to look at the logs or set up your logs to like go to something like Logstash. Um, in an upcoming release, we're gonna provide like a GDB like ability so that you can like attach and receive all the events of your command pipeline running and like have it sent to you as like a DM or something so you don't you know, clutter up your chat room. That was really the motivation for reworking the whole chat provider interface that we, we just actually merged today. Also, how do you get a history of what has been run or what's in progress? Can you sort of get gather status from everything? So like, you know, deploys running, things that are going on, what? Uh, yeah, that data is, COG has all of that data, we just don't expose it. Um, we could certainly write a built-in command to expose that. COG knows about everything that's currently in flight and things that have just finished, so you can easily get that data. And there are like IDs attached to each one, so you can find them uniquely? Yep. Uh, every pipeline I've run gets its own unique ID, and so you can see exactly like this ran at this time. In fact, COG has, not super pretty. I don't know how readable this is going to be in a shell and a terminal window, but we uh, log in JSON everything that a user executes. So at this time, they ran this pipeline. This was the, the context. This is all the data that the pipeline generated. This is what time it finished, and this was the final disposition of the pipeline. Yes? Uh, so if I'm trying to migrate my existing operations infrastructure to something like COG, I've already got you know, either I'm in AWS and I've got IAM accounts or I'm in a data center somewhere, I've got some kind of LDAP server or something. 
And if I want to migrate to this, it seems like I've got an entire new permissioning scheme and set of account access and management system to learn. Is there any integration with any existing system or do I really have to build it up from the ground again? Right now you have to build it up. That's on our roadmap. We, we know that that's not like an ideal situation for folks that have existing infrastructure and existing like identity and, and authorization. Um, so we definitely want to integrate with that. We're just not there yet. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. So, um, well, then go, then go, go for it. Okay, so I have a few questions. Um, have you considered, I don't know, have you made or have you considered making an actual CLI that interfaces with COG? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, uh, one of my personal kind of mad science projects is I found there's a, a command line Slack client uh, written in Go that I've been, I found on GitHub that I've been uh, poking around at extending so that you could do all of this from the command line. Good. Definitely something we want to do. So do you see this being an eventual replacement for something like mCollective or the EC2 run command? Uh, not necessarily. I, I, I see this more as um, a way to, to kind of be more transparent and collaborative. Um, I know a lot of people, we, we've had more than a few people say, oh, I, I could use this to replace this orchestration thing I've already got. But um, while you could certainly do that, that's not really the, the design goal. OK. Um, is there, if for people who are using Hubot, is there any way, easy way to migrate the existing extensions and in whatever configuration they have? Right now, no. And that's because uh, the Hubot scripts I really have access to all the Hubot's internals. So there's not a real easy way to migrate that. Okay, and just one thing to clarify, are bundles dependent on Docker? Are they, or no. can you have a non-Dockerized bundle? You can, so there are two types of bundles. There is a Docker bundle uh, that uses uh, a Docker image to distribute the actual executable for the command. Uh, the other kind is a native bundle where really the only thing that exists is the config YAML for the metadata. And uh, the native command, uh, COG just assumes it's going to be somewhere in its path and we'll just shell out and run it on, on the relay. And is the, I don't know if it's currently, I'm imagining not, is the ability to speak to more than one, one chat server at a time on your roadmap? Uh, yeah, so that actually uh, works now. Okay. Uh, so you can have multiple active providers at one time. So you can you can't have like multiple instances of the same chat provider, but say you had like Slack and HipChat for some reason, you could have both of those active. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Does anyone else have any last minute questions they had? Just in case. Keeping them. Okay, great. Well, again, thanks. So Kevin's gonna have trivia questions. If anyone. Uh, oh boy. Yeah. 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 Trivia questions. It can be really anything. There's no no pressure on anyone here. Those are the four books. Oh wow. So. Yeah, the first one's a doozy. But people get to choose which one. Maybe not everyone wants that one. Ah uh, yeah. So, volume four of the art of computer programming. But paperback. Wow. Just as intimidating as I remember. Okay, so for my first trivia question, let's see. Uh, oh, just so you know, so this is what oh. we'll do. do. Would you like to pick the people who are answering it, or I'll pick them and look for the first? We usually just go for the first hand up and try to call on them. Oh, okay, so, yeah, why don't you, you pick want, it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so what esoteric programming language does Erlang syntax most closely re resemble? Back left. Yes. All right, come on, grab a book. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So we have, yeah, Ruby the hard way. Gross. Yeah. <laughs> Go the programming, Ooh. yeah. You, you got a ah. Fascicle sense. Can't go wrong with that. Hey, fascicle, fascicle, anyway. Next question. The cycle. The cycle. Let me uh, think of another good one. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Blank, this is what I get for staying up too late. 
Um, what programming language is uh, the relay component written in? I saw you in the middle, in the back there. Yep. And the Go book. To go, as it were. Uh, what are the two kinds of command bundles COG supports? What are the two types of command bundles that COG supports? Over there? Yep. All right. Otherwise known as native and Docker bundles. Ruby and Ubuntu book, you can also choose to decline. I, I know him. He, he may or may not be interested in either of these. <laughs> oh. All right. Oh, let's see. What's another good question? Yeah. Oh, we can quit after this one, or if you're if you're if you're well, driving. I've got uh, one more. So, all right. Um, what uh, what is um, let's see, what protocol does Cog's built-in message bus use? Yep. All right. There we go. Sorry, Julian. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's it. We have one more book if you have another question, but we can also let it go with that. Yeah, I'm I'm good. All right. We have that's it. Yeah, Ruby and Ubuntu. Oh yeah. Well, wait, wait, hold on. One, one. I think we have a simple, a simple question. Brian had a recommendation. This is a book, uh, Ubuntu Unleashed, 2016 edition, covering 15.10 and 6.04. Uh, who wants it? All right, there you go. Sorry, his hand went up first. There you go. Thanks again, Kevin. So we're going to be going to um, uh, what's the name of the bar again, Spiros? Jake's Saloon over on 7th Avenue and 23rd Street. So we'll all be heading out in a few minutes. So gather your stuff. Come with, please. We'll see you there.